Greetings from Tales from SYO Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Today is going to be the first, probably, of many in the next couple of four years that I talk about Bernie's America, famine, hardship, and death. Today I'm going to talk about socialism generally, Bernie Sanders in particular, whom after hereafter I will be calling Crazy Bernie. One, oh God, Alexandria Ortazio-Cortez, whose name I can never get right, so I will just call her Red Cortez from here on out, because they are the poster children of American socialism, as well as the poster children of the power-mad, sociopathic, narcissistic morons who infest the halls of government at every level. I must tell you, socialism kills. It, as always says in my lower third, socialism and communism always fail, and they kill tens of millions in the process. And this is a true statement. In the last century alone, at least 150 million people died in the name of socialism and communism. 150 million. That's a less than half the current population of the United States. Socialism kills because it is impossible to manage an economy the size of the United States that has at least 20 separate cultures, largely based on geographic or economic differences, from a central government. You just can't do it. You can't take something this big and manage it from one central government. It's just impossible. Even if it were, you run into the problem that Lord Acton noted centuries ago. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. If you put absolute power into the hands of people in a central government in a country this geographically large and this economically disparate, what you're going to find is that they become corrupt. They be turn themselves into nothing but tyrants. We have seen it before. We would see it again. Thinking about Crazy Bernie's platform in particular, let's look at some of the particular planks. Medicare for all. Now, this sounds great until you know the truth about Medicare and what it is, and that it's a shoddy system that is inefficient and controlled by power-mad sociopathic narcissists, just like Crazy Bernie and Red Cortez. It is also totally unnecessary. The reason that we have seen the cost of medical care in the U.S. go so high is because the U.S. federal government has been unconstitutionally meddling with it for over a century. Now, let me give you an example of what medical care can look like when the U.S. federal government isn't meddling with it unconstitutionally. Now, what I'm about to show you is a 1954 clip from the episode of the TV series Dragnet. Now, one thing to be aware of is, while this is obviously a fictionalized account, it is, however, based on files from the LAPD. They were always very careful at the beginning of that show to state, the story that you're about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. So keep in mind that what we're about to watch here would not have been considered unusual back in 1954 in terms of what we have for medical care. So watch this exchange. Eight forty-six p.m. We reached the hotel at the corner of Pembroke and Columbia Streets. We talked with one of the officers in the radio unit that answered the call. He told us that his partner was out checking the neighborhood. We talked with the ambulance attendant, and he told us that the cut on the victim's head was not serious. The victim identified himself to us as Dr. Aaron R. Platt. We asked him what had happened. That's hard to answer, sir. It's hard to tell you what happened. I'm not too sure about it myself. If you tell us what you do know, sir. I received a call tonight that a woman was ill. Who'd the call come from, doctor? It came through my call service. What time was this, doctor? Well, it must have been about 7.45. My call service would have a record of it. You can get in touch with them. You ever seen these people before? No. So you want to tell us what happened? As I told you, I got a call from my service, gave me this address and the room number. What'd your call service tell you? Just said that a woman needed a physician. I came right over. All right, would you go ahead? Well, when I came into the hotel, I checked with the room clerk downstairs and asked about Mr. and Mrs. Allen. He told me they were in this room. Allen, huh? Mm -hmm. That's the name they gave me. Mm -hmm. I came up, knocked on the door, and Mr. Allen opened it. I suppose that's his real name to you. Well, we'll check on it, Doctor. It'd be a little silly to give the real name and then do a thing like this. Yeah. What happened after the man let you into the room? Well, I told him who I was, and he said that his wife was ill. Where was she? 
lying in the bed all covered up, I went over to her and asked her what was wrong. What'd she say? Nothing. She moaned a little. Then her husband, I guess that's who he was, told me that it was her side. Said that she'd had a pain all evening. Yeah. He asked me if I thought it might be appendix. I told him there are a lot of other things that cause pain in the side beside appendix. Mm -hmm. I went over to the bed to take the woman's temperature. That's when the man locked the door. Sir? I heard this noise. I turned around, saw the man turning the night latch on the door. I asked him why he was doing that, and he told me he didn't want us to be disturbed. At the time, I, I thought it was a little strange, no reason to lock the door, but, but he had a reason. He had one. Yeah. After that, I went over to the woman again and reached out for the thermometer. All of a sudden, she jumped up out of bed, jumped at me. I turned around and asked what this was all about. And I saw the man, he had a gun standing right behind me, and I saw him start to swing the gun, and then... Well, that's the last I remember until I came to. I called the police, that's it. You never saw these people before? No. No, I remembered if I did. Do you have any idea why they'd call you? No. No, the man said something to the girl on the board of my call service. You can check with her. Oh, I wonder if I could have a cigarette. Sure. Thanks. Could I have my coat, please? Yes, sir. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, that's funny. What's that, sir? My lighter, it's gone. Solid gold, present for my wife. I'd hate to lose that. <laughs> the top opens up when you spin the flint thing, you know? Yes, sir. How about your other personal effects? What was that? Your other effects, Doctor, your wallet, your money. Gone. Gone, everything. The thieves, they robbed me. That's what they did. I don't mind the money, only $30, $40, but the cards in my wallet. Rotten thieves. Look here. What's that, sir? My watch. They even took my watch. Automatic. It was a good one. My wife gave me that, too. Can you give us a description of these articles? Well, I certainly can. I've got the case and movement numbers at the watch in my office. I can give you that. You want a complete description of the man and the woman, too, Doctor? Well, I gave one to the other officers. Yes, sir, but we'd like to go over it with you. Oh, all right. Say, wait a minute. Yes, sir? My bag, do you see it? What's that, sir? My doctor's bag. Must be in the room someplace, unless they took that, too. Just sit still, Doctor. We'll look for it. Oh. Joe, here it is. I thought he wouldn't touch that, Doctor. Well, I want to see what's in it. You mind moving some of those things, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. Instruments are all there. That's what they took, all right. All of it. What's that, Doctor? Narcotics. And that was medical care in 1954 in Los Angeles. I'm going to include a link in my description box below so that you can see the entire episode. It's here on YouTube because it is a wonderful, wonderful look at what medical care looked like in 1954 before there was more than half a century of government meddling. There had been some up to that point that had caused it to get worse. But at that point, doctors were still making house calls to anyone at any time of day. And the price for this would have been paid by out-of-pocket. This would not have been something that would have been paid, you know, unusually or gone into debt over. It would be paid out-of-pocket and it would be affordable no matter how poor the person was. In point of fact, doctors made house calls. They came to your home rather than you having to go to them if you were sick. Until the 1970s, I remember when I was very young, they were still making house calls. And the cost for it would be paid out of pocket by anyone. You didn't need health insurance. You didn't need any of that. You just paid out of pocket, no matter how poor you were. So what changed since then? Well, government intrusion changed. Now, first off, you had to be aware that there is no language in the Constitution that would authorize the federal government to be involved in health care or medicine or anything related to it in any way. Under the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, this is a right left to the states or the people. By regulating health care for over a hundred years, the government has removed anything like a free market in health care. Furthermore, every aspect of health care is regulated, and all aspects of insurance are regulated, thus causing the mess that we have today. If you want things to get better, repeal every single unconstitutional federal law that deals with health care. They are, as I say, unconstitutional by any sane reading of the document. What you need to do, however, is read the document. By the way, who do you think is going to pay for Medicare for all? Because <laughs> you could tax every rich person at 100% and it wouldn't matter. 
Health, Medicare for all, single payer in the United States would cost hundreds of billions of dollars. And if you add up every dime of every billionaire that just doesn't cover it, that means your taxes are going up. It doesn't matter about the billionaires. You can take all their money. It ain't going to cover it. Your taxes are going up. Then we have another one of Crazy Bernie's um, platforms, planks. Free college tuition. Well, yeah, this sounds really great until you realize what caused tuition to skyrocket in the first place. One guess as to what it was. Yep, government interference. Since the 1960s, the federal government has unconstitutionally been meddling in education. There is no language in the Constitution that would authorize the federal government to be involved in education at any level, in any way. Under the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, it is a right left to the states or to the people. The worst of this meddling... And the reason that tuition is now so expensive happened in the 1990s. At that point, the federal government unconstitutionally, remember there is no language in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to be involved in this in any way, they began guaranteeing student loans. And that meant if a student dropped out or defaulted on their student loan, if they had one, the federal government would pay that college or university anyway. So that meant that a college or university could admit anyone, no matter how stupid or capable they were of pay passing a course. And if they were stupid and couldn't pass, when they inevitably dropped out and they were left with no skills with which to repay their loan, the institution, the college or the university, would get the money anyway from the federal government. And in fact, now there is every incentive to accept stupid people because the college or the university will get paid whether or not the person stays in school or not. It also means that a college or university can charge anything they want because all the students now are getting a loan and the federal government is going to give them the money regardless. In fact, there is now every incentive to charge anything they like because the federal government will give them the money regardless of what happens. If you want to see the cost of education decrease, get government out of it. Repeal all the unconstitutional laws regarding education because, again, this, there is no language in the Constitution that authorizes it. It is flatly unconstitutional by any stretch of the imagination, by any sane reading of that document. All you have to do is read it. And this would include getting rid of all unconstitutional guaranteeing of student loans. Once you do this, college and universities were going to only admit those people who can actually get a degree and lower tuition to what a student can reasonably pay out of pocket, which was, by the way, the way things were up until the 1970s. Now we get into the more esoteric ideas of plat platform planks in crazy Bernie's uh, nonsensical uh, way of doing things. Economic justice. This is a flat-out impossibility. No one can even agree on what economic justice means. So barring any actual definition, I can only assume that they mean the Marxist one. From each, according to his ability, to each, according to his need. Which means you take the money from the people that have it, and you give it to the ones that don't. Well, that worked out real well for the former Soviet Union, didn't it? Also worked out real well for every other communist nation that was formed in the 20th century. Every single one of them fell or, was in the pro or is still in the process of falling, and it is all marked by famine, hardship, and death. We don't even have to look past our own hemisphere to see it in action. Venezuela. Venezuela, once a booming economy, went socialist, and now they're falling completely apart with, what a shock, famine, hardship, and death. We don't even have to look outside the U.S. borders to see it in action today. Look behind me. This is a picture from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. The Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota is generally ranked the number one slum in the entire United States. It has never, in my lifetime, never fallen be below the number three slum. This is socialism. This is socialism for about 150 years. 
They have had socialism for 150 years, dependent on government for everything. Everyone there gets a measly government check that keeps them in poverty, living in places like this. This is not an unusual thing. I've been to the Pine Ridge. At one point, I considered running for Senate in uh, U.S. Senate uh, from South Dakota. And as a libertarian, I knew I was going to lose big. But I figured, what the hell, if I was going to lose, let me see if I could lose by getting the one block that no one ever gives a rat's ass about in South Dakota, and that's the Native American block. So I spent some time in the Pine Ridge, and I am telling you, this, normal, just absolutely normal. Some of it's even, hell, I'll put up the picture that I always keep for this, my Pine Ridge Indian Reservation pick. This is the Pine Ridge. These are two people on the Pine Ridge. The outhouse is real. They do not have indoor plumbing. The garbage that you're seeing around there is not there because they can't be bothered to pick it up. It's because it won't fit in a house. Well, it's probably a tin shanty with no insulation during the, oh, I don't know, 10 or so degrees below zero that you get out there in the, in the winter along with 110 in the summer. And they can't they cannot throw all this stuff away. They never know when you might want to use it. Some of that stuff you're seeing in there is decades, generations old. That thing that they're bathing the baby in, that tub, has been used for 4,000 other things over the course of the last two, three generations. You dare not, when you are this poor, you dare not throw anything away because you just don't know what else you might need it for. That's why they have all that garbage there. That is what socialism brings you. It brings you to utter complete poverty. Yes, you get, <laughs> oh man, you get uh, economic equality. You get to be poor. Everybody gets to be poor. You all get to be dependent on the same measly tiny government paycheck that will never ever go up and that barely covers living in a place like this. This is what socialism brings you. And in any case, as I've said before, there is no language in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to be involved in economic justice in any way. Under the Tenth Amendment, it is a right left to the states or the people. So let me see. What other stupid things does uh, Crazy Bernie have in his platform? Racial justice. What the hell does that mean? That is really impossible to even address without a definition. And in any case, there is no language in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to be involved in racial justice, whatever the hell that means. So under the Tenth Amendment, it is a right left to the states or the people. He also has environmental justice under there. What the hell does that even mean? That is again impossible to even address without a definition. And in any case, there is no language in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to be involved in environmental justice. Therefore, under the Tenth Amendment, it is a right left to the states or the people, whatever the hell it means. If he means something like renewable energy, well, there's also no language in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to be involved in energy whatsoever, renewable or otherwise. Therefore, under the Tenth Amendment, it is a right left to the states or the people. If he means climate science, then he's simply a fool or a very adept con man taking advantage of the fact that America's schools no longer educate, they indoctrinate. And one of the indoctrinations has been the easily disprovable notion of human-caused climate change. Now, my own video in which I rebutted this was removed from YouTube, and I cannot re-upload it. Thank you, YouTube. However, you can find it on BitChute, and there is a link to it in my description box below. Please go watch. I will knock it out of the park for you. There is no scientific basis for what is called climate science. And as a real computer scientist, I am offended, frankly, that it even falls into the category of science. It is the modern-day snake oil or Y2K problem. Now I have to warn you about something, because it's important to tell you. If Crazy Bernie and or Red Cortez are allowed to do what they want, there will be war. There will be a bloody civil war.
And why is that? Because I and millions of others will not go along with it. We will fight with our guns. And that, by the way, is the main reason for the Second Amendment. It's why it exists, to fight those like Crazy Bernie or Red Cortez who would deprive us of our rights. And if you think that the overwhelming majority of the U.S. military won't fall on the side of liberty, you have another thing coming. Those guys, get this straight because it's very important, those men and women in service of the country swore an oath not to protect you, but to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. If Red Cortez and or Crazy Bernie got their way, they would absolutely be a menace, a, a, uh, an enemy domestic, a domestic enemy, and our military would fight them. And the Crazy Bernie and Red Cortez and their allies would die. Please, for God's sake, don't take us there. We will fight. I guess that's all I have to say about that. So uh, thanks for watching. And if you like what I'm doing, please like, sub, hit the notification bell, tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, and pets, and livestock to do the same. I'd certainly appreciate your support. And there is a link down below to my subscribe star and my PayPal tip jar, as well as a page on my website where you can find other ways to support me if you like. And so thank you for your support. And remember, for a breath of fresh air, Watch Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.